It's good to be here in the house of the Lord of the morning where God is on the throne. Ain't no virus on the throne. God is on the throne this morning. So it is a, it is a pleasure uh, to be with my church family uh, this morning. And, uh, and we love every one of you, and we pray you all get some toilet paper very, very soon. So, oh, goodness. But no, we, uh, you know, I was going through Scripture a little bit this morning, and um, Scripture is certainly the living word, isn't it? <clears throat> it is there to encourage us, and I was sharing with the kids um, Wednesday night. You know, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. And um, we will trust the Lord, and you know we're going. We'll be doing some things, but we're going to trust in the Lord and uh, and trust His Word. And we're going to read His Word, and we're going to be encouraged by it. And uh, one other scripture I found this morning, uh, James four eight: Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. So we go to God's Word for instruction, and it teaches and encourages us. So. <clears throat> Uh, a few announcements. First, everybody take out a pen and a piece of paper or your phone, and I'm going to give you a website that I want you all to know about. It's www.mthopebaptistal.com. Our church website is now live and up and running. So we have the, a skeleton site up now. Uh, we have links to our YouTube page on there, <clears throat> and we can use it as a way to get information out and update folks, and um, you know, the plan was to have that up anyways, but went ahead and got the, the trigger pulled this week, so the website is up and running, and uh, we're happy for that, and uh, we'll, <coughs> yeah, so, so, that's <coughs> three W's, <coughs> dot, M-T, that stands for Mount, it don't matter, Hope Baptist AL.com. The reason the AL is there because there's a like five Mount Hope Baptist churches in every state in the union I have discovered. So <clears throat> some of them do, absolutely. <clears throat> so if you can go to dot com or dot org, anyone will take you to the uh, to the right page. But um, so we've got that uh, up and going. Uh, some other announcements going on. Uh, we're still planning the Easter celebration as of now. <clears throat> uh, we may make some modifications to it, but we're still planning our Easter celebration. Uh, so candy and eggs, uh, we certainly appreciate that. Um, excuse me. What was that? They start out of yeah, they start running out of plastic eggs, we're in real trouble. <clears throat> so we... Um, uh, Brother Jonathan will be sharing with us, uh, you know, any programming changes coming up, so we'll be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> but on a very serious note, uh, this has been declared as a National Day of Prayer. Um, we know that President Trump has declared a National Day of Prayer, but the Southern Baptist Convention has also asked for all churches uh, to be praying on this day specifically. And, uh, and it says, in light of the coronavirus global pandemic, we're asking all Southern Baptists in our 47,500 plus churches of the Southern Baptist Convention to commit to a dedicated time of prayer today and to seek the Lord in unity about these four matters. One, ask God in His mercy to stop this pandemic and save lives, not only in our communities, but around the world, particularly in places that are unequipped medically to deal with the virus. Uh, two, pray for President Donald Trump and other government leaders, international, federal, state, and local, to have the wisdom to direct us in the best courses of action for prevention and care. Third, Scripture says, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Pray that the Lord will give us wisdom in this moment of fears, the foundations of what we know are shaken, that others would realize how fragile life is and how real eternity is, and they would see their need to turn to God. And fourth, ask God to protect our missionaries and their families around the globe using this global crisis to advance His good news to the whole world. Uh, so this morning, we're going to open up in prayer, and I just invite you uh, where you're at, um, let's diligently seek the Lord uh, to call on His name this morning. Um, so join me if you would please. Gracious God, we thank you that we can come to you this morning. We thank you that your word says we're two or more gathered, there you are also. We know that you delight in the prayers of your people. 
Lord, I know there's many that are coming to you this morning that probably haven't in a very long time. Lord, we know that your word says that all things work for good for them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. So, Lord, we know that you can take this global national disaster and you can take it and use it for your good. Lord, that people will recognize the fragility of this life to know that there is a God on the throne who loves us and cares for us and wants to provide a way for us to be with Him for all eternity. And Lord, my prayer this morning, first of all, is that so many lives that are, that are fearful, that are hurting, that are concerned, would be able to look to you this day. And that through all this, that they would come to know you as a personal Savior. Lord, may the kingdom of God grow this day because of this thing that man fears. Lord, we do pray that you would stop this virus. Lord, it is spreading rapidly through nations across the world. We see it begin to, to move through our communities here in the United States. Lord, we pray that by your grace that you would withhold it. Lord, you would provide healing for those who have contracted it. Lord, that you would show your mercy upon us. Lord, we pray for our government leaders this morning. We pray for Donald Trump, his administration. We pray for the leaders in Congress. We pray for our state, our county, our city leaders, our school boards. Lord, we pray for great wisdom. Lord, to be able to accurately assess the situation, to be able to make the correct decisions. Lord, I pray that you would guide us all, that we may act faithfully to the duties that have been called upon us. And Lord, I pray for our missionaries scattered across the world, or so many places where they have chosen to be in harm's way, whether that be in the way of a, of a country that would just as soon shoot them as look at them. Lord, countries where Christians are imprisoned, and now in places where a virus threatens them. But Lord, we know that you are greater. And Lord, I just pray that this morning that you would put a special protection around our missionaries, that you would keep them safe, and Lord, that you would give them opportunities that they have never had before because of this virus to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ and how others can have salvation. Because Lord, we know that at the end of the day, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And Lord, if we know you, then one day we are going to have a perfect body that will know no sickness, no illness, that no virus can touch. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, I just want to tell you this morning that I worship you as you are our great and sovereign and mighty God. Lord, no matter what happens, I choose in worship to submit to you. Just as Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And no matter what happens in our life and in this world, Lord God, we come to you and we say, blessed be your name. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And we say all these things, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to 657 as we sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Would you stand, please? <laughs>
Good to see you in the Lord's house today. As you know, we're facing a, a, a global situation with the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, we've put a lot of prayer and thought into that. Uh, 
both for the congregation here as well as our community. Uh, I've been researching this for my professional job as well, and I've got lots of family and lots of friends around the world, some of which are sitting in a quarantine situation right now. It's always better to err on the side of caution than it is to take risks, and we don't say that lightly. So we want to alter our services beginning today, today forward, in that we're going to suspend our Sunday night services and we're going to suspend our Wednesday night services. Sunday morning at this time will still carry on just as it has this morning. It's a very fluid situation. It changes rapidly. and There's a lot of misinformation being spread um, by the, the news, the media, it's so much so that the news can't stay ahead of it, so uh, it's six one way, half a dozen the other way. As Billy said earlier, we do have an active website, and that is www.mounthopebaptistal.com. You can log on to that. There's a link to our YouTube channel where we post all of our services, and I will still be posting Sunday night messages as well as beginning to post Wednesday night messages so that you can log on, you can watch that from your phone. If you don't have that address, text me and I'll send it to you. Once you log on to our YouTube channel, there's an option to like and subscribe. And what that will do is that will give you an avenue if when we post something, it'll ping you either by text message or by email or however you choose to have communications so that you'll know that something has been updated. So you can still take out your, your copy of the Word of God. You can still be in that attitude of prayer, and you can be praying. And the Bible says where two or more gather, and I've told many people this week, a lot of times that's me and the Holy Spirit, but where two or more gather, there God will be in our midst. So we appreciate your patience as we work through this. We do have posters and flyers out in the vestibule about our Easter celebration that's going to be a community outreach. I encourage you to take those um, as you're out and about and drop those in several different places. We do have sign-up sheets for people to sign up to do anything from set up and take down to cooking, to working a game, to just walking through the crowd and passing out evangelistic cards. There's going to be lots of opportunities to serve, and this is outreach for Mount Hope Community. And all the churches that participate in our sunrise service are going to be in this with us, and they're very excited. Uh, God has blessed us with the, the facilities to be able to put this on, and, and so far most of our sister churches are really carrying the burden of this. So in that vein, if you'd like to donate some door prizes, maybe like a $25 Walmart card or something along those lines, something that's easily passed out for adults, feel free to do so. Let me know if that's something that might interest you there. So, uh, one last thing I want to just put a post out for. Yesterday, we did have our food bank, as we do every month. And uh, Brother Billy, Pastor Billy, did a food prep service. And what he does, just so you know, is he takes the things that would be passed out in our food pantry, and he prepares meals based upon what that would look like. And my family was privileged to go down there and see, and my college student and my soon-to-be college student were taking notes of how simple those meal preps were. We want to open that up to anyone to come and see and, and, and take his recipes and things. He's a culinary chef in his own right. He started speaking in tongues about all these spices, and I was like, yeah, I'm Baptist in the name of Jesus. Stop talking like that in front of me. It's great. I'll eat it. You fix it. That's the deal we'll live through. So he can teach you how to do things. In, in packages, I believe he said he used to when he was working retail, would provide every day for a week. He would build all that up and put those in the refrigerator and freezer, so all he had to do was basically grab and go. And I mean, that is a godsend if you're on schedules like some of us are on. So I encourage you, the next time we have one of those, I'll do a better job of letting everybody know. You can just show up down the Life Center, see what he's done, Maybe grab a sampling, or three in my case, um, and then grab some, some uh, recipes on the way out the door. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Right. Thank you for reminding me of that. That segments into my next statement I want to make. The schools will be meeting until Wednesday, and then they will be closed. There is a lot of angst about how to feed some of the children that normally only get fed at school for breakfast and lunch. Billy's made some, some, some go boxes. They're down here in the Life Center, and there's going to be a lot of need in the short run, probably just a couple of weeks, but still, a couple of weeks add up in a hurry. So if you know somebody that is without, that is in need, we do have means to try to meet some of those needs. So again, let me know how we can handle that. So. Right. Um, Miss Letha has now been elevated to a driver position, and she's in the homes taking meals to, the, to our shut-ins. And I know when my daddy was receiving those, it was a blessing because there was somebody else coming in the home to check on my daddy, you know, because there were gaps. We tried to keep it covered, especially there toward the end, but if you have no interaction, that once a day is just beautiful to have, so... Again, if you know of a need, a serious need, let me know. We'll do what we can to try to meet those needs. I want to open us in a word of prayer and see what God has for us today. And as we do, as we bow this morning, um, it may be that you're like me. And you've got some friends in another part of the world that are struggling. Maybe you've got some friends or some family that you've not been able to make contact with. Let's just call them out to God right now. Just say, God, I, I need a touch. I need you to stand on the bow of my boat of life and just say, peace, be still. God, calm the storms, Lord, so I can hear a word from you. And Father, that's my prayer this morning, Lord. Father, I feel like this situation has brought me even closer to you. Father, those nights when you've woke me up and it seems to be quite regular and I spend hours praying, God, I thank you that you've drawn me that close. God, praying for my brothers and my sisters, praying for my co-workers, praying for those people that I've come to know throughout this beautiful world that you gave us to live in. God, I pray for peace. God, I pray for grace. God, I pray for you to have your hand in this situation, Lord, that you calm your children. But Father, we see that sometimes, Lord, it takes a crisis to draw people close to you. God, I pray that this morning, Lord, as we study your word, that we see just how fragile life is, not just through the happenings that's going on in our world, but God, how you said so in your word. God, please help us to get something this morning that we can take home with us. God, please help us get something this morning, Lord, that will change us. It will open our eyes to see the souls that are slipping through our fingers into the pit of devil's hell. God, move us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 4 with me this morning. And we're going to talk about an uncertain tomorrow. And I believe we can all say that we are facing uncertain times. It seems like when there's a tragedy happens or a natural, national disaster happens or something along those veins, it draws us closer to something that has the answers. Something that can give us some peace, some kind of reassurance. Something that can say, hey, this is going to be okay. Forgetting sometimes that we're not promised tomorrow. As much as we would like to be, we're not. We are a frail existence. James talks about that at the end of chapter 4. At the beginning of chapter 4, he talks about drawing nigh to God. And he says in verse 3, You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss. I get a lot of emails and a lot of videos and We've had issues with our server, and we've had to really tighten down some things because some people don't understand you don't just open everything that comes through your email box, but in some of those that I know and I can trust, 
I see some videos of some people that are saying some things that really concerns me. They're saying if you ask, you get. But that's not the case because asking amiss does not guarantee the answer to the equation that has been posed. I can pray in the name of Jesus, let there be a Ferrari sitting in my parking spot out here. It's not going to happen because it's not God's will for me to have said Ferrari just quite yet. I can ask for a lot of things, but just because I put that stickler in there in the name of Jesus does not mean it's going to happen because it's not in God's will. And that's what we don't want to hear. What is God's will for our life? As a pastor, I'm asked to go in and pray for people that they be healed. And I know what healing is in man's eyes. It's getting up and walking out. But healing in God's eyes may be taken home. It's hard for me to go in and speak that to people. I'm going to pray for God's will to be done and let Him answer the questions, okay? So in James chapter 4, the Bible says, Go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The first thing I want us to look at this morning is the best laid plans. And we talked about this this morning. I went to get Brother Billy out of the Sunday school class he was in, and they said, You've got to have a plan, and that's true. We need to have a plan for our life. We have to ask ourselves, What is our hope for tomorrow? As we sat down just a few moments ago to talk about. What we want to do as far as service times in this church, some of us said, you know guys, we've got to go back to work tomorrow. I have a plan in place for my office. I have some, some parts that are supposed to come in someday this week. Otherwise, I can work from my home as long as I've got an internet connection. I've got a plan in place, but what is our personal private hope for tomorrow? What is it about tomorrow that excites us? You have to have something that you wake up to, something that gets you out of the bed. What new adventures do we have in store for tomorrow? Maybe we're already daydreaming today about what we're going to do tomorrow. We have that in our life, and that's what makes us human. What is today, though? What is it that's in today that bores us so much that we're spending all of our time daydreaming about tomorrow. This person that James spoke of, they're so bored where they're at that they want to move to a new city and continue there and buying and selling and get gain because they can't enjoy where they are today. What situations are we in today that maybe we're trying to avoid that we say, hey, tomorrow's a new day and it'll be new tomorrow and we can have new mercies tomorrow that we cannot or do not have today. Or maybe we're in a situation that is so rash that we're praying for today to disappear and get on into the morrow so we can wash our hands of whatever's going on today. What was our yesterday like? What haunts us today about yesterday? We've all got a past. Just this week, God allowed me to be used in a glorious way to speak to somebody that was sharing with me about some things that had gone on in their past. And I said, listen, I've not always been a preacher. And even when I has been, I've still got a past. It's there. It's there. It follows us. What is it that haunts us that we're running from that we think if I can just move to a new city, move to a new place in life, everything's going to be okay. Are we using today as medicine to run from the past? 
Are we planning on the future to erase the issues of today and yesterday? Do you know how fragile life is? For some, tomorrow may not come. For some, today is all we have. We look at the best laid plans. Then in verse 14, he talks about the longevity of life. And that's something we do not want to think about. He says, you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. How long have we lived? Man, it just blows my mind that I'm going to hit the 5-0 this year. I mean, that's the, that's the pinnacle of the black balloons and the dead roses or stems only that everybody's got to send to you and the, the licorice candy that nobody really likes, you know. I mean, that's the biggie. But I'm not talking about it in terms of years or days. How long have we lived a life that is worthy to be called living? How long have we really lived? If you took your existence to this point and threw it in a box and went through it and said, these are the things that matter and these are the things that don't, which box would fill up first? Now that's humbling to me. That's humbling to me because a lot of my life I've either spent idling or spinning in the ditch. I've used a lot of fuel in both instances, but I've got nothing to show for it. What has been the quality of our life? How do we define quality in our life? Is it the things that we've collected? Is it the deals that we've made? Or is it how much life we've breathed into somebody else? To sit down with somebody face to face that's really facing a serious situation and show them in God's Word where God has this. How long has it been since we've done that? What legacy are we leaving behind? So many times I find myself reminiscing about somebody I'm wearing a tie tack this morning that my father-in-law wore. And I love every time I put it on, I think about Bob and how precious he was to me and how he would set me down as his son-in-law, even dating his daughter. He would set me down and say, listen, I'm going to give you some advice. And you take what you want and you leave what you don't, but I'm going to love you the same no matter what. And I promise you, there's very few morsels that I left laying on that table. That's a legacy that I wish my children could have sat down across from that table and got firsthand. But he went to be with the Lord when we were pregnant with Emma only three months in. I think about my granddaddy. He was a preacher and also a fisherman. And he said, son, you either got your fishing pole in your car or you got your Bible in the car. Because if the fish ain't biting, the men will be. And if the men ain't biting, the fish will be. But you're always catching something. Man, I wish my kids could have sat down with him. I wish they could have heard the stories he told and those worms that he pulled out. He remembered what fish he caught on it. Here, boy, take his home and you go catch a fish with it too. And he remembered next time he saw me. Did you catch a fish on that worm I gave you? What legacy are we leaving behind? It's not the things that we've collected or the deals that we've made. It's the impact that we've had on somebody else's life. What is our anticipation for the future? Some of us, it may be just to survive through this whatever we want to call it. You can call it a global pandemic. You can call it the biggest farce that's ever been pushed out by the media. No matter how you see it, what are you planning for the future? Is it easier living, smoother sailing, working more, working less? Where is God in our futuristic plans? Do you want to get closer to God today than you were yesterday? What does tomorrow say? Where are the souls? that are dying and going to hell at in our plans. Just think about that for a minute. God, I want to share my testimony with somebody today and tomorrow 
and the day after tomorrow and however many more days you give me until you call me home. And if I'm trapped in a car in a ditch and they're cutting me out, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. You know, if you can't get me out of this car and this is the end of my life, you know what? If you had x-ray vision, you'd see my soul going up to heaven here in just a few minutes. But what if this was you? Could we be bold enough to live a life like that? You doing all right today as you check out? Sure, every day is a good day if you know Jesus Christ. So what kind of day are you having then? How does God figure into our future? The Bible says life is a vapor. And vapor is a lot like smoke. Now I'm not talking about those things that can blow the lips off your face and people drive down the road and it looks like their car is on fire when it comes out. I'm talking about just the smoke. Some waft here and there and some waft there and some are... Huge burning, but they are temporary. They don't last forever. Some vapors are easy to see and some are not. I was sharing with my cousin this week who has bone cancer and how she's looking forward to seeing Jesus. And you know, we're always short to say, I want to see so and so and I want to see such and such. But we don't say, I want to see Jesus. That's down the line. That's the first person I want to see. But as I was sharing with her what God was laying on my heart, talking about vapors and how some are big vapors and how some are small vapors, I've got a little brother in heaven waiting on me that never lived outside my mama. That's a very short vapor. Then I've got another brother in heaven waiting on me that got to live 40 years and two days. That's a little bit longer vapor. Then I've got a grandfather that was in his late 90s when he went to be with the Lord. Then I've got a dear, precious friend that I was able to preach her funeral that was 102 years old. I'm going to get the long vapor. But we're not all guaranteed the same vapor, are we? And as we walk through our life, we should see those around us and wonder, hey, how much vapor have they got left? It appears for a little time and then vanishes. It's kind of like those brush piles that I've been trying to burn. I'll get the biggest old brush pile going and I think, Lord, this is going to burn the world up. And five minutes later, it's stone cold. And I'm standing there thinking, man, I couldn't burn a dry mule with 100 gallons of gasoline. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Some are here only for a little time. You know we're all on the clock. Some of y'all remember punching a clock. I don't have to do that anymore, thank the Lord Jesus. When I worked over muscle shows, we had to punch a clock. And the people that worked in the office didn't have to punch a clock, so the people in the shop complained about it. So I made us all start punching the clock. Boy, I was real popular after that. You walk in there and clunk, well, I'm on the clock now. I got to do what the boss says. And then clunk, I'm off the clock. I got to do what my wife says. But you know, in life, we're all on the clock. When we started breathing, we punched. When we started life, we punched. When are we going to punch off? Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed that a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. We've all got a day with destiny. And destiny will not be argued with. When our time to punch is time to punch, it's going to be punched. Lastly, the consciousness of sin. The best laid plans in my life can just be blown out the window at a moment's notice. I never know what the day's going to hold until a certain time and everything else can go out the window. I'm starting to wonder about the longevity of my life and what I'm leaving behind in those that knew me. Lastly, we've got to look at the consciousness of sin. Because James is very clear when he talks about the boastings and how sinful it is and that him that knoweth to do good that doeth it not, to him it is sin. If the Lord wills, you ever heard that, if the Lord's willing? If the Lord's willing, the creek don't rise. If the Lord allows me to get up in the morning. What is the Lord's will for our life? Me, us, you as an individual. What does God want for you? Is it to move to another city? Is it move to another position? Is it go somewhere else and try to prosper yourself? Is it to work toward personal gain? Is it to continue to be self-absorbed, 
not worrying about anything that's going on around us. I dare say nobody's going to be worried about shaking much hands for a little while. I dare say nobody's going to be worried too much about what's going on in somebody else's life. Because we're going to be pretty self-absorbed. I've got to take care of myself. I've got to make sure I save for myself. But you know, that's kind of a stark reminder of how we kind of live our lives. We go through life pushing the buggy and we never ask anybody else how they are spiritually. We boast in our arrogance, which is evil. You know, this is not our life to live. I wasn't put here to build things. I wasn't put here to create things. I was put here to serve a holy God. I was put here to surrender my life to Him. It's kind of like guys, you know, when we get married, we get that ring on our finger and in our nose and we can be pulled around by our wife. I am now hers and she is now mine. But she yells louder than I do and she's redheaded, so I have to submit at the end of the day. I love you, babe. But you just imagine that this is not your life. The Bible says we are bought with a price. What was that price? Jesus Christ giving His life on a cross for you. For those people that sit on the other side of the wall from me. For those people that are standing in line at the grocery store with me. For those people that bombard me with emails and text messages. For those people that I see on the television. They're all bought with a price. And this is a gift from our God. This life to be used to bring honor and glory to Him. He says to Him who knows to do good and does not do it to Him that is sin. What are we doing with our life? We've got to ask that question. What are we doing with our life? Are we running from the past? Are we daydreaming about the future? Or are we making today the present that it is? If we're pushing back on God, then guess what? That's sin. How are we bringing glory to God with our life? You know, it's so easy to glory in the past sometimes when you get to sharing stories about what you've done and where you've been. The older I get, the better I was and the faster I was and the better looking I was and filling the blank was. But do we ever glorify the past? Or do we say, God delivered me from those things? When we daydream about those dreams that we want to do in the future and those things that we want to do in the not too distance, is God in those dreams? I make jokes a lot of time about whenever we're able to retire, the Lord calling us a full-time ministry down in the Bahamas where it's always warm and my wife ain't going to hurt and I can preach in shorts and flip-flops. Serving God. How much God is in our daily routine? Every day, not Sunday, not Wednesday. Let's say Monday. How much God is in our Monday? I have a dear, precious friend. I hope he's watching this. Sends me a text message at least once a day, if not two times or three times a day, with a devotion in it that I need. And I mean, it's like I don't ever see this person. Bless his heart, he's precious, but I have not laid eyes on him in months. And it's like he knows exactly what I'm going through because that's what he slaps me with. And if a couple hours go by and I hadn't responded, he's asking me, am I sick in the hospital or ignoring him? So it's not like I don't have that accountability in my life. How much God is in our presence? To omit God when the Holy Spirit is demanding action is sin. How are we impacting the kingdom of heaven with our life? Are we helping it or hurting it? How is God obviously getting glory from our life? And I don't mean you've got to go up and tell somebody about it either. I mean they can just see it when you walk in the room. They can just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. They just, they just know. And you've told them. And they know because you've told them. But they know without any, even any words 
being spoken. How is our life giving glory to God? It's not ours. We're bought with a price. We've been given a decision. We're going to accept Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior of our life and thus surrendering our life to Him to do His bidding, His calling, His demanding on our life? Are we doing our thing? And there's going to come a time somewhere out in the future when I get one of those round to it and feel like it, that I'm going to give my life to the Lord and I'm going to do what God called me to do and I'm going to be the greatest missionary ever to walk the face of this planet for the three days maybe that I have left to live. The worst thing you ever want to hear is somebody on their deathbed saying, man, I wish I'd have just given my life to the Lord when I was first called. I know in my life personally, I ran from my calling for 18 years. I did the math the other day. That's how long I ran. I was 18 when God called me and I was 36 when I surrendered. When I started getting my life in order. How many fingers slipped through my hands in those 18 years? Now I knew the Lord at 9, so you figure 9 to 18, I had about 9 productive years, and then I made the decision I took the wrong fork in the road with my life. How many slipped through? God's running several of them back to the front and I'm having an opportunity to talk to them, but I may not live long enough and travel far enough to see some of those. Some of those may have already left this walk of life. How many more am I willing to say, you know, that's one more I gave up for God. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. Brother Jeff and Miss Beth, come on up. In just a minute, we'll sing and we'll do business with the Lord. Right now, I just want you to ask yourself, is this your life? 